I said to you, when you look at bloodlines, do not only look at the curses and bloodlines, but look at the blessings and bloodlines. Because there are particular families that are grace gifted by God to be able to walk in certain abilities. And it's in the blood. There are some families that have royalty. Some people carry the grace for wealth. Some people carry the warrior's anointing. You know, and if you look through the Bible, God usually spoke to people along the lines of their tribes. And even when Jesus was addressing the churches, he spoke to the church in Philadelphia, spoke to the church in Laodicea. So there's something about tribe and genealogy and genetic makeup and lineage. But many times when we think about our lineages, we only think about the curses, but we don't think about the blessings. So within Solomon's was the blessing of the authority given to him to be a temple builder. But there was also a weakness, which was with women not knowing where to stop. And it was multiplied in Solomon. So whatever in you that you don't deal with is multiplying your seed. Whether it is brokenness, pain, shame, disgrace, fornication, once you don't deal with it, in your seed it is multiplied. So here is that weakness multiplied in Solomon and it then became the thing that affected his sacred authority. I need you to hear that. So even in your life, as I teach you about authority, don't talk, don't think only about the glory of it. Also think about the warning in it that you must take care of the weaknesses on the inside of you. Because in the day that you are building multiple temples, you were not given the right to build, you will not know. Because the thing about authority is that it will always answer for you. The Bible says the blessings and the callings of God are without repentance. So in the day that Solomon was crafting beautiful temples for Baal, his wisdom did not stop. His understanding did not end. His power for wealth and for building glorious temples did not cease. So many times we don't know we have fallen into error and misuse of authority because the oil is still flowing. So it is the constraints and the consecrations that helps us to know what the boundaries are. You are with me? Fantastic. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. So, um, and another thing the Lord said to me to say to you people also along the lines of um, authority and generations was he also said I should um, speak to you about in, in light of multiplication to know when you have stopped but you should not have stopped. And how that has the capacity to affect your future generations and the authority your generations will carry. Now, let me explain it to you. So God used the story of Eli to speak to me. And he said to me, he said, there was an authority that Eli carried that was taken away from Eli and given to a different household. Remember, the priesthood was always in households. It was in the tribe and it was in the houses. So the people that were supposed to continue the priesthood were supposed to be the sons of Eli, which were Hophni and Phinehas. But it ended up leaving the house of Eli and going into the house of Samuel because Eli was not able to teach his sons along the path of the authority he had received. And I needed to fully understand this because you see, the thing about authority is that it doesn't end in the day that you die. There is a representation you will have for all eternity that is determined by how you prepared your future generations to continue in the authority that you originally had. Understand what I'm saying? There is a reputation you will have for all eternity that is determined by how you prepared your seed to continue with the authority that God originally gave to you. Now, here is Eli giving authority by God to be the priest at that time, but to also be a judge in Israel. And Eli did not teach Hophni and Phinehas. Now, God said to Eli, Eli, because you are not doing what you're supposed to do, you know, because you are not doing what you're supposed to do, I am going to, you know, deal with you, warn your sons, talk to your sons. But Eli did not counsel his sons. And Eli's authority ended with him. Now, but why did this happen? Because in Deuteronomy, the Bible speaks about what the punishment should be for 
priests that are perverted or priests that do not live up to the responsibility of their priesthood. There is, a, there is an effect that should happen or there is something that should happen to such priests. They should be stoned, they should be killed, they should be dealt with, cast out of the, cast away from the tent, from the people. Eli was not willing to do any of this. Because Eli was unwilling to do it, Eli was ready for his authority to end with him. And see, this is very critical because remember I told you authority is rabbah, multiply. Now from the moment that Eli refused to address the brokenness, the weakness, and the failures of his sons, Eli's authority already began to dwindle. And that was when God raised Samuel. And God began to stir up the heart of Hannah to pray right so that Samuel could come forth. Now, your inability to move, to change, to evolve according to the will of God can become the stagnation or the death of your authority. The death of your authority in time and the death of your authority in eternity. Because what then happened was that Eli's household was completely wiped off. So his sons did not carry the priesthood and even to future generations, they were eradicated from priesthood. Why? Because Eli did not know when to continue. Eli was old. Eli probably thought to himself, look, I'm going to die anyways, just a few years, I'm tired, I've done my best. For some of us, you may have been successful at a particular thing or a particular way of doing business, doing life, doing marriage, doing ministry, and God is telling you it is time to evolve. God is telling you it is time to pivot. God is telling you it is time to change. You are thinking to yourself, after 20 years, after 30 years, I might as well just die like this. I might as well just keep doing this. After all, I'm used to this. I'm successful at this. I'm too old to make a mistake now. If I change, I may make mistakes. I'm too old to start learning new tricks. Your inability to pivot in the day that God commands you to can become the very thing that starts killing your authority. The day that a man's authority is stripped from him, it's not usually evident. It will give it time. And you will see that another person, another people, another generation will rise up. And the very thing you were called to do, they begin to do it more excellently than you. And this is how people are kicked out of the market. So God began to say to you that this is your business. This is your branding business. This is your marketing business. I want to give you a new strategy. There is a new platform, new apps I want you to create. And you are thinking, God, this is already working. We have contracts with multinationals locked down for the next five years. And what you don't know is that after five years, there's about to be a break in the market. And things are going to change. And the demand will completely change overnight and will not give you time to metamorphosize into what is required in the new day. And there will be a people that from the moment you made up your heart to disobey God, there will be a people that God starts preparing so that in the day of opportunity, when you fail to show up, they take what you were supposed to get. So authority taken or authority lost is not usually evident in the day of disobedience. It is in the day of opportunity that like Samson, you seek to shake yourself and stir up yourself to do the same thing again and you find out that you have no audience. That is where you know you have been stripped of your authority. So God said, I should say this to people and I should make sure I say this to you. So please take note of it about knowing how about multiplying authority in future generations. So Eli thought, this is my sons, forget about it. So for some of you here, you have children. Your children know nothing about the things that are sacred to you. Your children know nothing. When I say sacred, I'm not just talking about prayer and worship. Hear me clearly. The sacredness of humanity is not only in the, the communion system of man with God. The sacredness of humanity is in the assignment of humanity. Man was assigned by God to manage the earth. So part of your sacred commissioning and authority is that you know how to create structures. You know how to create systems. You know how to multiply. You know how to dominate markets. You know how to dominate nations. You know how to reproduce good. This is part of your sacred commissioning. 
So I'm not saying that your inability to transfer to future generation the sacredness of your commissioning, I'm not talking about only singing, praying, and shouting. Do your children understand why you work till 12 p.m. to 12 a.m.? Do your children understand why you study and you read books consistently? Do your children understand why there are certain things you don't do, why you don't drink alcohol? Do they know your stand and your principle about life? Because it is within the boundaries of your consecration and constraints that is where the activation of your authority is. So you cannot transfer that authority to your children until you teach them the constraints of the authority. You understand what I'm saying? So Eli failed at doing this. So what happened was that his glory ended with him. And the day that Eli died, his sons died with him. Okay, great, great. So what I said was that I was speaking about the sons of Eli, and I said, so your inability to teach your seed the boundaries and the constraints of the authority that you possess, it is going to be what will make it impossible for them to carry that same authority in their time. You know, so I said it is expedient that we teach this to our children and we teach this to our seed. Part of the reasons why God chose Abraham was because he knew he could trust Abraham to teach it to his children. That's what the Bible says. So authority doesn't end with you. If you look at the system of God's authority or God's authority structure, it is always from fathers to sons, fathers to sons. Jesus spoke, as I see my father do is what I do, as I hear my father says what I say. All authority has been given to him by his father. So God gives it to Abraham, Abraham gives it to Isaac, Isaac gives it to Jacob, Jacob gives it to the tribes. The tribes are leaving it out and passing it to their children. So the kingdom structure of authority dissemination is in bloodline. So, but also knowing what to distill in your bloodline. What is the good authority given to you and what is the weak link that may destroy that authority, as in the case of Solomon and David. But, um, yeah, so I want to go back now into um, the frameworks, the authority frameworks. So if you have heard me, and if, before I go into the, the last three frameworks, so that we can go on, because we have some grounds to cover. But if you've heard me, if you've received from me, if you know that, um, you have caught a couple of things in the past one hour that I've been teaching. I want you to put it in the chat box. Um, I want someone who can do a quick recap. Tell me three things you've learned and three things you're taking with you um, that has been beneficial to you in the past one hour. Okay. So there is something wrong with the sound, they say. I think maybe it's at your end, guys. Thank you, Dr. Salin says, teach your children the constraints of authority. Thank you. I want to see it. Let's go. Let's go. From the moment you make up your mind to disobey God, he starts raising someone else. NJ, that's fantastic. Um, Gloria says, listen to God's strategies. Um, authority is all about mastery. That's what the brook um, Mohiza says. Whatever I don't deal with in, my, in, in me will be multiplied in my seed. Yes, abundant life. Authority hinges on mastery. God, I need to know my tov and its boundaries and deal with my weaknesses. Yes, until you know or have a, know a thing, you cannot have authority over it. Um, Adaisa says, your inability to pivot in the day that God commands you to can become the day your authority dies. Absolutely, Adaisa, thank you. Um, so... Um, Shiro says, authority lost is not evident in the day of disobedience, but on the day of opportunity. I love that point, Shiro. Um, Uni says, the greatest thing about authority is knowing when to stop. Thank you. Okoyo says, my authority should be part of my children's spiritual inheritance. Absolutely. Um, so I have authority, okay, longev longevity of working in authority depends on submitting to boundaries and consecrations. Thank you. Uh, conservations with God, conversations with God. All right. Okay. So let us go on. I have been hearing. So Paul Osukwe says, understand the nature, system, DNA, mechanisms, and structure of your tove. Oh, fantastic. Did I say that? Okay. I think I'm good. All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, so authority is not without constraints. That's a good point. So let's go on. Um, so I think I, I have a class that is with me. So let's go on. Remember, we did not finish the four authority frameworks. Yesterday, we were able to take the first framework, which is the power of choice and the liberty of doing as you please. And I began to teach you what that framework looks like and the different points. So when we say the power of choice, you know, um, what does it look like? Yes, thank you, T.Y. I can see that inability to evolve as instructed by God will make you irrelevant in the next season. Absolutely. Um, so under the power of choice, which is the first framework of authority. So guys, we're supposed to end at 9 p.m. West African time, but please permit me to push it just a bit further because of all the little things we're having. I'm going to push it to 9.30, okay? Uh, because we have our curriculum for today and we haven't even entered today's curriculum. We're supposed to start with um, the trading of authority in the realm of the spirit. So, but just to finish the framework, so the power of choice, we said the power to choose life, the power to choose who you will serve, the power to choose wisdom, the power to choose genuine freedom, and the power to choose to trust God. It is when you are able to activate all this power, that is when you are working in a measure of exousia, which is authority. Now, within the same framework of exousia is the power of the mind. And I shared with you people the dream that I had the night before about the mind and the word for the mind being the same word for potter, for pottery, for frame, and how your mind is the frame of your life. Your mind is the potter that shapes your life. Your mind is a pottery in itself. So whatever your mind engages, your life will create. So your mind is a wireless transmitter that controls your life. So whatever your mind is thinking and framing, it is wirelessly instructing the elements of your life to produce it and manifest it. So it becomes very expedient that you wage a good warfare in your mind. So part of the meaning of exousia, which is authority, is mental and physical power. So a person that has authority must have mental power. A person that has authority must know how to control their mind. Let me tell you something. Um, there was a time when I was feeling sick. A particular thing was wrong with me, and I had taken all kinds of medication, and it wasn't going. And the Lord said to me, Isi, you are healed. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I am not healed. And the Lord said to me, Isi, you are healed. And I was like, um, it's like you are not seeing what I'm experiencing. I'm telling you I am not. And God said to me, Isi, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. He, I'm telling you, you are healed. But as long as you keep thinking and believing the symptoms, you will not be healed. And so God said, your mind needs to come into alignment with where I have brought you into in the spirit. He says, your mind has not fully received the reality of your spirit. That's why your body is acting the way it is. Because you have to understand that the body is merely the substrate where the different elements of humanity operate. So the spirit and the soul is in the body. And of course, your mind also. So your body just manifests what is predominant or the predominant authority within it. So if your spirit is governing, your body manifests spiritual realities. So God said to me, your mind is still subjected to canal thinking, so you cannot manifest the healing. So I had to take out time to just pray, and I started meditating upon the fact that it was possible for God to do it. I started meditating upon that fact that it was possible for God to do it. And then happened was that it ceased. I just focused on my mind. So even when I was feeling the symptoms, I started saying to myself, no, I am here. The Lord, this is a reality. This thing I'm feeling is not real. The reality is that God has taken this away from me. Satan is merely taking advantage of my inability to meet God on the level of his declarations. And after staying there for a while, I saw that my body began to manifest the reality of the spirit that my mind had received. And so you will say that, oh, I took authority over that sickness. But how did I do it? It was called my mental power. 
That is part of the definitions of authority. Now, so um, Proverbs 23 verse 7, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. I want you to understand something that the thoughts of God are life. You know, so the Bible says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your souls prosper. My thoughts for you are thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a hope and an expected end. So because God thought it, it became our reality. Hear me. He said, these are my thoughts for you. Because he thought it, it became the reality of a believer. We think that our thoughts are intangible. And we think that our thoughts have no form in the physical. But it is because you cannot see the spirit realm. That's why you think your thoughts are intangible. What you think is hidden in your mind is exposed in the spirit. And the spirit does not understand joke. The spirit does not understand false impute, imputation so or in impute or false imputes. Whatever you impute in the form of thoughts, your spirit runs with it. So you are a powerful being. Man is a super, super, super duper computer. So where our normal computers fail, and still wait for manual inputs. Man is the highest level of AI that you can find. From the moment we imagine it, it is taken as an input, and the spirit realm starts to run with it. So it is going to make you, it is going to require you to impute a different data and information through your thoughts, to call it back. That is if it, is, if it has not even gone past the place where you can call it back. So you have to, Take scriptures seriously if you're going to walk in authority. Very simple. As you think, so you are. As you think, so you are. As you think, so you are. Very simple. Now, when Satan wants to attack you for manifesting powerfully in a particular area or location or time, Satan affects your thoughts concerning that matter and makes you begin to think you are powerless you are not that good. You are not that great. They don't like you. The nation does not love you. Your friends are not here. So that in that place, you are not able to manifest great strength. You may manifest it somewhere else, but not there. I've seen many men who say, oh, in my house, I cannot do anything. I don't feel like I'm a man. But at work, you are a winner. Is it possible that if you can, you can rethink your home into a different place. Maybe if you begin to sit back and say to yourself, perhaps there's a possibility, as long as it's not a witch I have married, perhaps there's a, a, a misunderstanding that is making it impossible for the thoughts of success to rest in this home. That's why we are not succeeding together. So maybe I need to pray about our minds arriving at a place of understanding so that when we meet on the level of righteous thinking, we are able to manifest righteousness in our home. As you think, so you are. As you think, so you are. There are people who have beaten down their maybe wives before or husbands before and you spent years being a narcissist and then after a while, you, you are now a recovery narcissist so that there's a bit of constraint on you now because you now know that there's social media, people can talk. And all of a sudden, you want your marriage to be better. But the complaint you are having now is that that spouse is not able to be the person that you want them to be. They're not able to love you the way you want. But the problem is you have reconfigured the person's mind to believe they are not good enough. So after 10 years of imputing a particular data, it is hard for that person to begin to manifest a different personality or the personality that you want now. The person is manifesting the personality of you are not good enough, you are not strong enough, you are not able, you are not thorough enough, you don't know how to think well, you don't know how to think straight, you are too poor, the fact the way you are, you are not desirable. So you expect that person you told is not desirable to wear a G string, F string, Q string, high heel, red lipstick and show up for you as a damsel? Of course not. Because you have reconstructed their thoughts to believe that they are not desirable. So they don't have the ability to manifest what a woman who is confident that they are desirable, what that woman will manifest. 
So for you to change that, you then have to go through the same process. The same way you spent five years imputing a poor data, that is the same way you have to find, spend another five years imputing the right data that you want to see. Is anybody with me? So, as a man thinks, so he is. So your authority can be taken away from you if your thinking can be manipulated by darkness. So people have lost their authority, not because they sinned or not because God took it from them, but because they just did not know how to guard the thoughts that were coming to them. That's why you must pray for people who are in authority over you, people who you listen to. Because if they tell you the wrong perception of who you are, it is imputed into your spirit as a thought pattern. And that thought pattern alone can make it impossible for you to walk in authority. Because exousia is also mental power, the way you think. Okay? So, as you go forward in the way you think, some scriptures I want you to read. I'm just going to skip so that we can go forward. Also read Proverbs, um, also read Romans 12 verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is to tell you that mind can be renewed. Okay? Mind can be renewed. Mind can be renewed. Very simple. Oh, but PI, it's so bad, you don't know how it is. It can be renewed. If there's somebody that you have hurt and you have broken, or you are somebody that has allowed that you've hurt yourself and broken yourself, remember this scripture, mind can be renewed. So that the mind that is tormented, the mind that is in pain, the mind that is broken, the mind that is weak and is not producing glorious results, that mind can be renewed. The problem that we have many times is that we are trying consistently to change the output when we have not dealt with the input. So we are trying to manipulate our lives to see results that we have not dealt with the signal that is entering our minds first. So make sure you go back. If you want to renew your mind, go back and deal with the signals that are entering the mind so that the output in your life is different. Mind can be renewed. Do the same thing with your children, with your sons. Do the same thing with them. Consistently renew the minds of your daughters. If there's a part of them that has been broken with time, or maybe they've gone through a kind of abuse, or anything has happened, remember, mind can be renewed. Did you catch the last things I said? I said, even with your children, even if... Um, they've gone through some sort of abuse or brokenness, remember, mind can be renewed. So you can just begin to impute new data consistently at a much greater speed and at a much deeper depth than the data that broke them. So that when you begin to impute this new data, it renews their mind. Okay? So another scripture um, that you should read is Philippians 4 verse 8. You know, so finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever things are true, whatever thing is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, praiseworthy, think of such things. The reason why the scripture commands us on how to think is because how you think determines the authority you walk in. Remember the story of Gideon, Gideon, who we now call a mighty man. Gideon was in a mindset of defeat. And the Lord said to him, Gideon, go and hear what they are saying about you. For some of you, what you need to do is to hear what your enemies are saying about you. To hear what your haters are saying about you. You are there afraid to step out. You are there afraid to bid for that contract. You are there afraid to put out your videos or to put out things. Meanwhile, you don't know what is being said about you. The greatest disservice that can be done to you is to hear only the condemnation of people and not hear the praises that have been said about you. That's why I'm careful of people who come to tell me only the bad things that people are saying about me, but do not tell me more things that are good that have been said. Be careful, because whether or not you think you are in control of that situation, that information, that data is being imputed into your spirit, and it is affecting the way you consider yourself, and it is in turn affecting your authority. So, do not only hear what people think bad, hear what people think good. 
Sometimes receive praises and let it settle. When people tell you this is how you have positively affected my life, hear it well. Sometimes tell them, explain it a little bit more. So you say, oh, Pierre, my God, you really changed my life. <laughs> and sometimes I'll say, oh, God, be praised. But sometimes I've started learning to say, really? Tell me, how, how did I change your life? And you begin to explain to me, oh, you know, there was this day when this, this happened and you said this. I'm like, oh, was that not an Instagram live? You said yes. And then I will remember that, wow, that Instagram live, I didn't want to do it, but I just felt a need to jump on. And then I look into my head that sometimes those spontaneous lives, because it can change somebody's life. Okay. I say, continue. And then you tell me, Pierre, the way you teach, the fact that you break things down, did it, it has, listen, you need to hear praises sometimes because it rewires your mind and those praises deal with the condemnation. Okay. So sometimes when I'm feeling low and I'm feeling like I can't go on, I can't move on. I call some of my friends and I tell them, this is how I'm feeling. You know, tell me about me. And they say, ah, P.I., hey, you, <laughs> you that this, you that that. You need to hear it sometimes. You need to have hype men around you. If all your friends are melancholic and sad, please change your circle. You need people who can remind you, sometimes sing your praises. This is why when warriors went to war, when they are coming back, there are women with tambourine. There are people shaking, shouting. The Bible speaks about the rejoicing, how sometimes the ground will be shaking in the city. Imagine a warrior that has gone to war and you are coming back to that kind of praise. The ground is shaking. People are singing. It helps you. You remember that, wow, I have done something good. Be careful of people who don't know how to celebrate your successes. When you do something good and they say, wow, I, I, I'm so proud of you. Well done. Come on. Yes, that's what you need. Do you understand? Don't, don't be that person who is always like, eh, eh, but you could have done these 10 other things better. Ha, bah. Do you understand? Praises are important. So God said to Gideon, Gideon, go and hear what is being said about you in the camp of the enemies. Because Gideon, if you can hear it, it will stir up the authority that I've put on the inside of you. Because there are gateways to authority. Part of the gate is the ear, the eyes, the hand. What you feel, what you hear, what you see are gates that govern, you know, the data that your authority works with. So you have to be careful. Um, all right. So just leaving. Also read 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. So just leaving um, the framework of mental capacity. There's so much I could teach you there, but, you know, let's go. On. And like I said to you about the mind, um, the Bible says he will keep in perfect peace those whose mind has stayed on him. I wish I could open that scripture. Okay, let me just speak about it real quickly. He'll keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed on him. It's, um, I think it's in Isaiah, is it 36 or so? He'll keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed on him. Now, when God, Isaiah 26 actually, not 36. Now, in that scripture, perfect peace the word for peace is the word shalom. And the word for perfect is also the word shalom. So basically, when God speaks about perfection, he's speaking about peace. So a perfect man is a man that is in the peace of God. So he says he will keep in shalom, shalom, those whose minds are stayed on him. Now, when you go further down, that word Shalom actually means different things. It means completeness, soundness, welfare, peace, health, prosperity, quietness, tranquility, contentment. It also means friendships, good relationships with human beings, having covenant relationship with God. That's shalom. It also means peace from war, from warfare. So God is telling you that when a person's mind rests in God and everything that you are thinking about, you impute God into the possibility of all your thoughts, something happens to you. You enter into the realm of shalom. He says he will keep in shalom, shalom, 
those whose minds are stayed on him. I remember mental capacity is part of the meaning of authority. So when your mind is sitting inside the possibilities of God, you enter into shalom. Now, shalom is not just a state of your heart. Shalom is the entire structure of your life. It determines your financial prosperity. It determines your relationships with people, whether they'll be good. It determines your relationship with God. It determines your welfare. It determines the health of your body. It determines the completeness of your life. This is shalom. And how does a man enter into shalom? Through his mind. Come on, somebody, if you can hear me, tell me, P.I., I can hear you. You enter into shalom through your mind. The mind is the gateway to the peace of God. And the peace of God is not just tranquility in your heart. It is contentment. It is welfare. You being well taken care of. It is health to your body. It is prosperity in your bank account. It is good relationships with people. This is shalom, but where does it begin? From your mind. So it is not just God, give me peace. God, make me complete. No, why you are saying God, make me complete? God is like, can you just keep your mind in me? Can you just stop straying from the thoughts of my goodness, my power? Can you just agree with my commandments? If you can decide that I am the final boss stop, to all your thoughts and decision making, then you have access to double measures of shalom. You just have to decide. Now, it is only a man that is in shalom that can have rabah. Only a man that is in shalom can have rabah. Remember, Adam and Eve knew no other reality apart from the reality of the glory of God. They were immersed in it. They were drenched in it. They were soaked in it. The reality of God was the only reality that they had. These guys were in shalom. And it was from shalom that they were able to do the will of God, have dominion on the earth. Okay? All right. So that is just speaking about mental um, capacity as part of the frameworks of authority. Now, when you, the next framework is the framework of the power to influence, the power to influence. So part of having authority is being able to influence people, things, and places. Now, there is the influence that you have on people, and there is the influence that is had on you, okay? And then there is the reason why you can influence. So on the influence, that you have on people. You want to consider scriptures like, let your light so shine, Matthew 5 verse 16, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, in this scripture, you then realize that it is conditional. Remember, we're on the topic of authority. It is condi conditional. It says let. So it is possible for your light to, for you to not allow your light shine. Excuse me, which I found out is the biggest problem that a lot of people have. The problem is not God. The problem is not that they don't have light. The problem is that many people do not know how to construct internal and external systems that permit their lights to shine. Let me give you an example. Me right now teaching you. This is me letting my light shine. I know that I'm a teacher. I know that there's a way in which I construct my notes. As a matter of fact, I have 24 pages of notes for the teaching on authority. What document? 24 pages right here. Just to teach you about authority. And this is because I, this is the abbreviated version. The fuller version is maybe like 50 something pages. Now, in speaking like in Nigeria, nobody send me this work. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, nobody's going to beat me if I don't teach on authority. But I choose to be thorough about how I teach. And I recognize, so that is me letting my light shine. Number two, I recognize that the normal church stru structure or system is not structured to permit me to effectively disseminate my light. At the most, I'm giving one hour to preach in a church. 
I cannot teach you the things that I have to teach you within one hour of a sermon. So you don't get the best of me when I'm holding the microphone and standing on the pulpit. You get the best of me if I'm sitting down and I'm teaching you, my notes are open, my computer is open, we're pacing ourselves, I'm communicating with you. Because I recognize this about my tove and the way my tove activates, I have created a structure that permits me to do this. Now, this is me letting my light shine. I have considered what I carry on the inside of me, and I have created a system that allows what I carry to be disseminated in a way that it can be appreciated, celebrated, and rewarded. There are some people that have given me seeds for changing their lives and have sown greatly into my life because they sat down under me for hours. Now, I could not, make, I could not have this capacity to show what I carry if I was dependent on a structure that does not permit my light to shine. You must allow yourself to be creative, bold, and audacious about reinventing systems to enable your light shine. Because every generation and every person is hardwired by God to invent and reinvent the systems of their times. And it is your reinvention based on the need of your internal man that enables society to move forward. So if you sit back and you say, well, this is what I have met, so I will not, I will just take it like that. You will realize that you are suppressed, repressed, and depressed. Because there is something about your tove. Your tove has a voice. Remember, God breathed into man the breath of life. So there is a living spirit within man. And so that spirit is constantly crying out for expression. And as long as the currently existing systems do not enable you to express fully, you will be dissatisfied on your inside. 